Bon, mais je crois qu'on peut, on peut démarrer. Bonjour, euh, merci d'être là, très nombreux pour rencontrer euh, Tom Fontana. Donc, je suis Dominique Lancelot, auteur euh, et producteur. Et euh, comme vous, j'ai envie euh, que Tom euh, nous raconte et nous explique un peu comment euh, euh, il a démarré sa carrière. Alors, il, a, il est né, je sais, à Buffalo en 51, où il a fait toutes ses études à Buffalo. Et, euh, et il a commencé, je pense, assez tôt, d'après ce que j'ai compris, à écrire euh, du, pour le théâtre. Et je voulais savoir comment, euh, nous avons envie de savoir comment il a rencontré l'écriture et euh, l'écriture pour la télévision. Hi, everybody. Um, I, uh, when I was very young, my uh, parents took my siblings and I to a production of uh, Alice in Wonderland. And I went home that night and started writing dialogue. I was probably seven or eight, and I haven't stopped writing dialogue ever since. Um, I didn't know I was writing dialogue. I didn't really know what I was doing. I just thought it was really like, oh, look, people talking, and you know, you make things up, make characters up. Um, that led to um, a career in the theater where um, I did a lot of things. I was a stage manager and a casting person and uh, worked in publicity. Uh, but I was always writing plays. And I moved to New York. Um, uh, I've lived in New York now over 40 years. More, yeah. And um, <clears throat> what happened in New York was I became the um, least successful playwright in the history of my generation. Uh, I was, um, I couldn't, I couldn't get plays done. I was, I, and they weren't very good. I, I mean, they're, they're, they were terrible. Um, so there was a reason they didn't get done. But um, uh, what happened was I was very lucky that um, I got a job uh, working at a place called the Williamstown Theater Festival, which was a summer theater in the Berkshires Mountains in Massachusetts. And um, uh, one of the parts of my, I was the assistant to the artistic director, but one of my jobs was I, I got to write a play for their second company, which was Young Actors. And um, so I wrote this play. And um, that summer, Blythe Danner was there with um, uh, her husband, Bruce Paltrow, and their two very small children. One of them you've probably heard of, Gwyneth and the other, uh, her brother, Jake. Um, and um, I had this play premiering, and the distance between where my, the theater was, where my play was being done, and the house that Bruce and Blythe rented was to the wall over there. So Bruce had to drive by my, the theater every day to and from uh, his house. And Blythe then brought the kids to the opening night, and they really liked it. And she said to him, you have to go see Tom's play. And I, and I had been friendly with Bruce, but I never had any. He was a te television producer, and I never had any interest in writing for television. So we would just drink and, and uh, have, have some laughs. And he said, all right, all right, I'm going to go see the play. And it was in repertory, so uh, it was playing every three or four days. And he, the whole summer went by, and he never went to see it. And um, he was very apologetic to me. And I said, oh, Bruce, don't worry about it. But Blythe was furious. And she said to him, I, you, I really wanted you to see this play. And you really should know Tom's work. And, and you better give him a job. So he was about to start this new series, St. Elsewhere. And he gave me the third episode to write. And um, I stayed. Uh, he hired me on staff, and then I became a producer writer, and the rest, as they say, is history. But I am convinced to this day, if he had seen the play, he would never, ever have hired me. <laughs> so I'm a living example of uh, don't be too ambitious, don't be too aggressive. Um, all I really ever wanted to do, all I ever prayed for, hoped for, was to be able to write every day and that someone would pay me to write every day. So I didn't really want, it wasn't about the money, it wasn't about the awards, it wasn't about anything other than, please God, just let me get up every morning and write. And so that's how I got into television. Then, after Sent Elsewhere, you... Uh, no. <laughs> 
I was like, oh, I understand her. I, know, I understand French all of a sudden. Vous avez rejoint l'équipe de, de assez vite, je crois, après la création. C'est pas vous qui avez créé la série Homicide Life on, euh, euh, oui, Life on Street. But, mais vous, avez, vous êtes rentré très vite à l'écriture et vous avez écrit beaucoup sur cette série-là. Hein. Et, et, et après est venu Oz, qui était votre première création en télévision, qui, je me souviens comme spectatrice, a été un grand coup de poing pour nous en France. On l'a vu assez vite l'année suivante sur Série Club. Et, et, et c'était frappant, la, la, la crudité, la violence, mais aussi euh, ce mélange de lyrisme euh, incroyable dans, dans les situations et les personnages qui nous a euh, transportés et c'est une série qui a eu euh, un Emmy Awards, plusieurs même peut-être je ne sais pas, en tout cas un je le sais et, et voilà qui vous a donc installé dans vos euh, je crois euh, obsession d'auteur enfin, on retrouve d'ailleurs des thèmes de Oz dans Borgia, on en parlera <rire> toujours un peu la rédemption le pardon, euh, les questionnements religieux, etc. Voilà, donc parlez-nous un petit peu de cette création là avant de passer à, à Borgia About uh, Oz Yeah, yeah. Well um, You know, as you said I um I, uh, my, learned everything I knew from, from Bruce Paltrow on St. Elsewhere, and then I moved on. Bru uh, Barry Levinson was looking for a showrunner for Homicide. They had had the, a draft of the first script, and I, um, and I came in uh, to work with Barry and Paul Antanasio, and then basically took, was given the show. That was what Barry wanted. And what was interesting about working on a show, you know, most cop shows, Uh, at least American cop shows, um, uh, CSI and uh, things like that. The, the, by the end of the hour, the bad guy gets caught and sent away, and you know, um, because you know that's we call it uh, Prozac television, where you just want to be very comforted at 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock before you go to bed and go, okay, all the bad guys are are in prison now, and. Um, And with Homicide, what we tried to do was to, like, just screw around with that. And, and you know, our, our policemen weren't, they were pretty sloppy at the work. And, and they, sometimes they solved the crime and sometimes they didn't. But what happened over the course of working on Homicide was when we did actually send someone to prison, I was like, well, what actually happens to them once they're in prison? I mean, the, the show ends, they're gone, and we never see them again. So I got this idea to write an episode uh, where we brought back a lot of the people who'd been uh, caught as murderers on the show and some new ones. Uh, and we went into the, there was a prison riot and uh, two people were killed. And so our homicide guys had to go in and investigate. And now they were, they were interrogating people that they had actually put in prison. And it was sort of like a test case for me uh, about whether you could do a show about a prison. And, um, and the other part of it was when I was young, when I was uh, in college, uh, there was a riot at Attica, which was a, a prison in, uh, still is a prison in New York State where I'm from. And, um, and it, was, it was insane, the whole thing. I mean, the takeover was insane and then the, and then the recapturing of it by the, by the uh, by the state police, uh, there was just murder and mayhem. It was a horrible, horrible, horrible thing. And that always stuck with me as, uh, as something I thought I should write about. So here I was writing a show about murder, but all the bad guys were going away. And here I had, had this thing in my head from when I was uh, you know, a student wanting to, wanting to write about, trying to understand prison, you know? So um, at the time, Uh, that I was trying to make uh, do a show. I pitched it at NBC, CBS, ABC, and Fox, and basically was uh, thrown out of the room at each network. They really did not want any part of it uh, or me. Uh, they just wanted me out. So I was I was like, oh well, that's an idea that's not going to go anywhere, and. Um, a very good friend of mine was in a meeting with Chris Albrecht at HBO. Now, at this point, HBO only showed movies. There were no 
series on HBO at the time. And he was talking to Chris, and Chris said, yeah, we want to get into, you know, scripted television, episodic television. Um, and my friend said, well, what kind of thing are you looking for? And he said, well, what we'd really like is a prison show. And my friend literally got up, went into the hallway, and called me and said, get to L.A. Get to L.A. tomorrow. Somebody's stupid enough to do your prison show. <laughs> so... <laughs> So off I flew to, um, to L.A. and sat with Chris and Anthemopoulos, who's one of the other producers on, on Borgia, and, um, and I told them this idea. And this was back in the day when HBO was, uh, was not part of uh, Time Warner. I mean, it wasn't part of the conglomerate that it is now. And Chris literally in the room said, okay, let's do it. And that's how we did it. That's how we did it. Uh, we, I, wrote a, I wrote a script, and, um, and we were off and running. And my whole idea, and when you talk about the themes, um, in all of my writing, going back to St. Elsewhere, uh, even back to the bad plays, um, I, I always have been um, uh, struggling or examining uh, man's relationship with God and, and what, what faith is, and what faith isn't, and when is faith a good thing, and when is faith destructive, and, and, a, and the attempt to, for each of us to find in some way a connection to God or whatever you call God or whatever God might be, um, whether it's through power, money, sex, um, being a, being a, a monk, uh, celibacy, whatever, um, and and so those those themes are in everything I've I've written. But always I had the idea of being a I'm a very 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 um, half-assed Catholic, and so I've always been like reading about the popes and and stuff like that. And I um, and I all and I would go into Chris Albrecht and Ann Thomopoulos's offices, and I would say. We have to do the bad popes. We have to do the bad popes. And they would be like, throw me out like I was thrown out by the people who didn't want to do prison shows. And then one day, Canal Plus was in a conversation with, uh, with uh, Steve, who's back there hiding somewhere. There he is. And uh, Anthemopoulos and, and Chris. And um, they said, oh, you know, with Lagadere, they said, oh, we'd like to do a show about the Borgia family. And literally, Anne went, I know just the guy. So twice in my life, uh, I was lucky that friends of mine were in the room when the idea was actually born. Um, so again, I'm a living example of don't be where you need to be at the moment you need to be there. Be in a bar somewhere or having a good time. So that's how I got to it. You have a lot of chance. Parce que peut-être, euh, chez vous, il y a des gens qui ont des idées folles, plus folles que chez nous, parfois. <rire> Ou nous, on a du mal à imposer un peu euh, des idées d'un pape ou d'une prison. Euh, mais euh, donc, Borgia, c'était un, un envie, en tout cas, pas les Borgia peut-être précisément, mais en tout cas, de parler de cet univers-là, hein, de, de la papauté. C'était un, un désir, de, de votre désir, qui a rencontré un projet... Euh, qui est né, euh, je ne sais pas de qui d'ailleurs au départ, euh, en France. Euh, Est-ce que c'est Canal qui a exprimé l'envie le, ou un producteur Je pense que peut-être euh, euh, dans l'équipe de, de Kentucky Scandilis, quelqu'un a eu cette idée-là. Je ne sais pas comment... Vous savez ça Comment, comment est née là-bas l'idée de faire un, un, une série sur les Borgia Je ne sais pas qui exactly um, exactement qui c'était Canal Plus ou Lagadère. I don't know who was the one who said, let's do the Borgia family. Um, it was Takis? No. Ah, so it was, okay. it was Lagadere. And, um, and so, yeah, so again, you know, they, they knew I wanted to do the bad popes. Okay. And uh, <laughs> so there we were. Et donc vous avez plongé là-dedans et j'ai entendu dire que vous aviez une somme de documentation euh, incroyable. Donc vous vous êtes documenté énormément avant de, avant de commencer euh, à écrire, même sur des, des, des textes qui venaient du Vatican. Euh, Racontez-nous un peu. Oui, um, um, 
I'm a, I'm a, first of all, I'm obsessed with history. I love history. I love research. So um, it actually wasn't work doing the research. Um, and this was the first period piece I'd ever worked on. Um, and I, um, what I very quickly realized was that um, if you read a current history of, say, the Borgia family, um, that the person who's written that book has basically writ read a book that was written 25 years before that by somebody else who had read a book written by somebody who'd written a book 25 years before that, who'd read a book, so on, so on, so on, so that the mistakes or the misconceptions just keep getting passed from book to book to book, that the research tends to be very sloppy. Because, I mean, there are, there are scholars, historians, scholars who are brilliant. But a lot of times when people want to do a book about Borgia, they want to do incest. They want to do all the, the kind of headline sensational stuff without really doing any research. So I thought to myself, well, I'm going to dig as deep into this as I can. And um, I got a lot of, I did, I did sneak my way into the Vatican Library, uh, told them I was working on, I don't know, I forget now, but some, something about Saint somebody, I don't know. Anyway, they, um, I, I, and of course, being uh, Rome, I knew somebody who knew somebody who I could pay to get into the Vatican Library. Um, and so, um, so I actually saw, for example, letters, handwritten letters, uh, obviously, by Lucrezia Borgia to her mother, Venoza Catanea. I saw the document that Alexander, Pope Alexander signed that divided the new world between Spain and Portugal. Um, and uh, and it, it wasn't really, ultimately, that wasn't so useful as what it was, was it really put me in touch with them on a very kind of, this is something they looked at. Their eyes looked at this, and now my eyes are looking at that. And I did the same thing in Rome. I went to all the places that are still standing where they lived or worked and stood in these rooms that they lived and worked in and um, just tried to, you know, the way you would go, oh, look at that corner, you know, look at that corner. They might have looked in that corner. Um, just to get sort of possessed by them, you know what I mean? And um, what I also did was I started to get a lot of contemporary uh, research. But what I discovered, for example, I was finding letters that uh, the ambassador from Ferrara would write to his boss, the Duke of Ferrara, or, or the ambassador to France would write to his boss. And what you discovered was they would write letters about the same event but they'd be completely different interpretations of what the event, what happened in the event. Because, oh, my boss, the King of France, loves Cesare Borgia, so I'm gonna write this really glowing uh, uh, depiction of what happened. Uh, whereas the Duke of Ferrara uh, hates the Borgia, so I'm gonna write my boss that things saying how terrible the Borgia are. And what I also discovered was that there was a lot of documents that were written after Rodrigo died, while Cesare and Lucrezia were still alive, where it was that Pope Julius II, Della Rovere, Borgia's great enemy, had hired writers, writers like us, to make up stories or to take a, take a small kernel of a story and, and make it far worse than the event actually was. So even the contemporary documents, you couldn't, you couldn't trust them 100%. But it became, very, it became a lot of fun because then it became about connecting the dots between the absolute fact that I could establish and the possible fact that was suggested by the documentation. And then my own sense of, well, this is who this character is and this is the journey that he or she is going to go on. Um, and I had to do all of that um, before uh, I wrote any of the scripts for the first season because I had to write a Bible. And um, I think uh, Olivier said it was 80 pages long, the Bible, the first season Bible for, for Borgia, because it was really, and there was so much minutiae in there and so much useless historical information, but 
I was really, it was like being on LSD or something. I was just like so into it. And it was great. It was, it was truly a joy. And, and doing the series from that point all the way to, you know, the last day of post um, ha, was a joy. It was a joy. Mais donc, vous avez quand même essayé de, de coller précisément à l'histoire parce que c'est vrai qu'on a, on a le sentiment parfois quand même que euh, c'est des personnages qui viennent beaucoup de vous dans leur... Euh, même si certains correspondent, César et oui, et le pape aussi, Lucrèce, on se demande parce qu'elle avait une réputation beaucoup plus sulfureuse euh, que celle, euh, que, que la, le personnage que vous avez euh, imaginé. Donc j'imagine qu'à travers les, les, les événements historiques qui sont à peu près respectés, vous avez quand même donné un contour à ces personnages qui n'étaient pas forcément exactement celui que, que l'histoire a retenu d'eux, mais plutôt ce qui venait de votre sentiment. Um, well, here, there's two things about that. One is that, um, first of all, Lucrezia Borgia is probably the most wrongly Uh, uh, besmirched uh, a historical character there is. She was, you know, everybody goes, oh, Lucrezia Borgia, she poisoned three husbands with a ring, po poisoned, put in a magic ring or something, I don't know. Anyway, none of that is true. Um, her first husband, uh, uh, they got divorced. Her second husband died, but it was killed by her brother, not by her, and she was actually devastated by it, historically true, and her third husband outlived her. So, and when she became the Duchess of Ferrara, she was an extraordinary Duchess. She was an enlightened, she had a, 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 a you know, a, a round table of scientists and poets and authors and around her, like Copernicus, and um, I mean, just great minds of the period Copernicus, Copernicus was a young man. It was where he sort of got his start. Uh, and so she was a truly remarkable woman. She, she was generous, built hospitals and libraries. And so she completely got a raw deal. It's interesting to constate that women, one more time, don't have no merit. We don't have no merit. Well, and, and, and so it became sort of a mission of mine to... Um, establish her, her real personality, or at my estimate of her real personality. But, that, but it, that goes to the larger question, which is the Borgia have a bad reputation through history, but if you look at the families that existed in Italy specifically at the time, most of them were far worse than the Borgia. I'll give you two examples. The king of Ferrara, I mean, not the king. The king of Naples um, had uh, was hated by his counts and his dukes, and there was all kinds of unrest. And the pope finally said to him, "This is pre uh, Alexander. Um, uh, you, you have to settle this. I don't want all this trouble." And so he invited the king of Naples, invited all of his dukes to a dinner at his house in the palace, and, and, and he had them all murdered in the room. Then he had their bodies stuffed, mummified, and hung in the dining room, along the walls of the dining room, so that every time anybody else ate in there, they would go, oh my god, he is a mean, mean guy. Now, the Borgia never did that. That's beyond Borgia, okay? The other example that, I, that is the Deste family, which is who um, uh, Lucrezia married into in Ferrara. The, the uh, Deste, her husband's father, murdered his stepbrother to get to the throne. Um, her husband's, two of his, her husband's brothers, which we do do this season on the show, Uh, conspired against him, tried to have a coup to overthrow him, and he had them thrown into prison, and they died in prison. So this is, uh, the, the behavior was not exclusively Borgia bad. It was, it was, everybody was bad. D'accord. <laughs> Alors une fois que vous aviez... Which, which by the way, makes great, <laughs> makes great drama. <laughs> yeah. Oui, alors on sait que vous aimez les personnages hors du commun, donc là vous étiez servi. 
Euh, alors, une fois que vous aviez cette base de documentation, comment ça s'est passé d'organiser l'écriture de cette série, alors même que c'était une coproduction européenne, une, la première, je crois, une des premières très importantes comme ça, qui a réuni beaucoup d'argent et, et, et beaucoup de, de moyens. Comment vous, auteur à New York, vous avez dealé avec toutes ces... Euh, peut-être euh, directive euh, contradictoire, enfin comment c'était comment possible et comment vous avez organisé l'écriture de la série parce que je crois que vous avez quand même travaillé en équipe euh, précisément d'une manière très organisée, très structurée, très hiérarchisée, donc euh, voilà, comment, comment ça se passait <rire> um, Well, first of all, you know, um, the idea was that Canal Plus wanted to have... Um, an American showrunner. They wanted to see what that system was like. <clears throat> so when I met with them, I said, look, I'm happy to do this. I'd be thrilled to do this. But we have to play by my rules. I, 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 I'm not going to say yes and then end up you, you know, sort of micromanaging me or whatever. I, I, that, that's, not the way, that's not the way this is going to work. And to Canal Plus's credit, they said, no, we understand. We will, we will advise you, we will tell you what we don't like, tell you what we do like, um, but ultimately the final decision for everything is yours. So that's the agreement we made and that's what they stayed true to all the way to the end. Um, and we had an incredibly great give and, give and take, with also with Lagardère, uh, with ZDF, the Germans, and Beta. Um, There was just, a, everybody understood what I was trying to do and was wonderfully supportive of it. So, so that was the first hurdle of this. And what I said initially was for the first season, it was really important for me to hire writers that I knew, that I had worked with, because whenever you're doing a new series, you, you're sort of walking out on thin ice and you want to make sure you know your team well enough to know that we can help you save each other if the ice breaks. So. Um, So all the writers the first season were uh, uh, American, uh, but again, they came from all sorts of different backgrounds. Two of them had dual citizenship with uh, Italy as well as uh, the US. One had dual citizenship with Ireland. Um, so they had, a, they, have, they had a European sensibility to them even though they you know, grew up in America. And what would happen is, is I would give them the, um, the individual story for their episode. And, but what I always say to the writers that I work with is, um, here's, the, here's the outline for the first episode. Personally, I've never stayed with an outline that I've ever written in my life. I'm always going off the outline of something hopefully better. So I always say, don't necessarily follow the outline. You, you understand what I'm going for thematically. You understand where the journey is of the character is for this particular episode. Um, do, it, do whatever you want. And I, and I always say, teach me what I don't know about my own series. And then in the second draft, I'll teach you what I do know about my series. So um, the, second, the first draft will come in and I'll give notes. And then the writer goes off and, and uh, does Uh, does a rewrite and then it comes back and then depending on where we are in the year one of the staff writers um, will take a pass at it just to try to get it to fit the everything else that's going on and then ultimately I do the final pass um, and then we get it ready for production but I also was taught by Bruce Paltrow that as a showrunner I have a responsibility not just creatively but financially and what that means in a lot of times is I The first day of prep, the script is pretty much done in the sense of these are the sets, these are the, these are the people in these scenes. Because you want to give all the department heads as much time as possible, especially when you're doing something with a period show where they have to build a lot of stuff. They just can't go to the local store and buy it. They have to actually build the costumes, build the, build the, the props. So. Um, I, uh, so it's really important that the script be done, at least from our point of view, on the first day of prep. Then the other hard part about being a showrunner is, is you have to then give the script away. 
you have to say to the director, take it and, and help me now, because I'm not a director, I've never wanted to direct. Take it and, and tell me what I need to know. What, where, where are we going with this in your mind? And then I work very closely with the director, um, talking through every scene, talking about the characters, where the characters are going, who the new characters are. And then we get, you know, the actors start giving their input. And I love being on the set. I, I, I understand that here writers aren't allowed on the set a lot of the times, which I, which I find shocking. Um, I love being on the set. I love the, I love the relationship that I have with the actors and the director because it, it, on the page it is only words. And when it's actually on the stage being filmed with actors saying the words, it becomes life. It becomes like life. And to me, that's the whole purpose of doing it. You know, it looks pretty on the page because you can spell check and all that nice stuff that computers do now. But how pretty it looks on the page doesn't really matter until an actor says it. Alors, oui, je comprends, <rire> je partage. Maintenant, ce qui m'intéresse, j'ai lu, et je voulais savoir si, comment ça fonctionne, si c'est vrai, que, que vous commencez par écrire euh, toujours le, le, le parcours d'un personnage que vous auriez écrit pour la série, ou en tout cas pour une saison entière, le parcours de, de, de chaque personnage euh, de manière indépendante, et que c'est à partir de ces parcours-là que vous avez composé ensuite chaque épisode en mélangeant et en tricotant euh, les, les destins. Voilà. Ça, ça c'est intéressant parce que c'est effectivement, en tant qu'auteur, euh, une façon de faire que, que je, que je que n'aurais pas eu, enfin une idée que je n'aurais pas eu. Donc ça me paraît assez... Je ne sais pas si ça se passe souvent comme ça ou si c'est votre méthode à vous euh, aux états unis de, de, de faire ce, comme ça, des, de travailler chaque personnage indépendamment des autres et ensuite de, de mélanger Well, I don't know about other, I can't speak for other showrunners, no, so don't I, I don't know. Um, I will say this, um, I did it on Oz and I did it with Borgia. I don't know if I could have done it with Homicide mm. because the, it was a different sort of show. Mm. Um, but what, what it does is, is it, it gives me a very clear sense of where I think the journey for that character is because I want my shows to be character driven. I don't want them to be plot driven because because mm -hmm. when they're plot driven, then you really serve the plot and it just gets you. You sit there with the third act going, oh, my God, I need mm -hmm. one more twist. Yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, we've got nothing. You're doing the 20th episode and there's no more twists left in the universe. Um, so I like to do stuff that's character based and uh, with Borgia because I had a very clear sense from the very beginning of the journey of each of the three characters for the whole life of the series. It was then just mapping out the individual season to say, okay, we're going to get this far in season one and this far in season two and this far in season three. Um, I just, I remember, and Mark, Mark Ryder's here, I remember the very beginning of shooting the first season he was constantly complaining to me about the fact, because he was, Cesare at that point was a seminarian, and he was, you know, uh, and, uh, and, and Stanley Weber, who played Juan, the brother, um, was out killing people, and, and he had swords and all that stuff, and Mark was like, I want a sword, I want a sword, and I was like, be patient, be patient, because the truth of it is that I knew in my head where Cesare was going, Mark was, Mark was just dealing with the scripts as they came out, so he didn't really have an idea where, the, where it was going. But I think it's important, I think two things are important about that. One is that you need to have a clear sense of the overall life of the character, but then you also have to say, now that I have this actor in this part, mm. now it, it actually, he's gonna teach me as much as I know. It, this is what happens in the, in the life of a series. I start out knowing everything about the character, and the actor doesn't know anything. And with a very short amount of time, depending on the actor, mm. they know more about the character than I do. <laughs> and so I'm now going to them going, well, I don't know, what do you think of, would he do this? You know. Um, so I think it's important to, to listen uh, as well as uh, 
you know, be sure of what you want, but then also be open to changing it yeah. if a better idea mm -hmm. comes along. J'ai lu, d'ailleurs, je pense que vous avez dit que quand vous avez vu incarner Rodrigo et euh, César et par John Bowman, Bowman et par euh, Mark Riddell, vous avez, ça vous a donné un élan euh, supplémentaire. Et on sent, hein, au cours de la deuxième saison, euh, que ces personnages prennent euh, une ampleur et, et une euh, ambivalence plus forte dans la deuxième saison. Alors, est-ce que ça, c'était déjà dans votre esprit ou c'est euh, aussi de, de voir ces acteurs s'emparer des personnages qui vous a euh, poussé davantage à, à, vers, dans, dans cette ambivalence I, I would say it was 90% the actors and 10% uh, a, a sense that that's where you need to go anyway. Um, but uh, um, it, 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 was, it was remarkable to see them become these characters and, uh, and, really, and really go like, oh, if I write this scene for Isolde, maybe she won't be able to do it. Maybe she'll really have to struggle. You know, you want to challenge the actors as much as, as anything else. And every time I would write for, for any of the three of them, they would knock the scene out of the park. And I'd be like, ah, oh, I got be, to be tougher next time. You know, more complicated, more yeah. complicated. So, yeah. Okay. Alors maintenant, pour, pour ce qui est de la relation avec euh, la réalisation, euh, quand on est un showrunner comme vous, euh, qui portez vraiment ces personnages hein, dans, les, dans les tripes, euh, on le sent, euh, comment, comment vous écrivez pour la, pour, 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 pour la réalisation Très précisément, les, les, comment les actions, les gestes, les expressions, vous les décrivez précisément vous attendez euh, du réalisateur vous, et des acteurs qui vous proposent euh, tout ça Qu Comment ça se passe euh, Parce que voilà, quand on écrit, parfois on a une vision euh, très précise de la façon dont la scène doit se dérouler. Et, euh, et, et si ça ne correspond pas, on est très malheureux. Alors euh, parfois on est très précis dans l'écriture pour, pour s'approcher, pour être sûr qu'on va obtenir à peu près ce qu'on avait dans la tête. C'est votre cas ou, ou pas Well, it, it's not my case because m nine times out of ten, I'm on the set. So I'm, I'm there to articulate vocally what yeah. I had in my head. I, but, I, you know, the, the, the two examples, um, um, the one bad one that I, that I Eugene O'Neill wrote extensive, extensive, extensive exposition, direction, stage directions. And that came out of the fact that his father was sort of a hambone actor from a style of acting that what was going out of style at the, at the time that Eugene O'Neill was writing. So he just wanted to make sure that nobody was going to ham up his plays. So that came out of just his own sort of insecurity. But I always look as a positive example of Shakespeare where I think, if I'm not mistaken, the longest stage direction that Shakespeare wrote was Exits Chased by a Bear. Now, if it's good enough for Shakespeare <laughs> to write five words of exposition, then it's fine with me to write. So I try, to, I try not to, because I don't want to, I don't do camera angles, and I don't, um, I, I just find that that's, that's cutting into somebody else's territory. But again, I have the freedom to do that because I'm going to be standing next to them yeah. and saying, oui. oh, well, have you thought about this? Or we've already talked about it in the room. Oui, c'est ça. Alors, donc, ça veut dire... <laughs> ça veut dire, donc, que vous préparez vraiment... Euh, sur... Donc, vous suivez le tournage du début à la fin. Vous êtes sur le plateau tous les jours. Et vous préparez avec le réalisateur, vous discutez de son, de son découpage, de sa façon de tourner la séquence, de faire bouger les acteurs. Jusqu'où ça va, cette précision et cette collaboration-là no, um, uh, what, what we do is we talk, about, we talk about casting, we talk about sets, we talk about the point of scenes, but I wouldn't tell a director what camera to use or what uh, angle or any of that stuff because, again, I feel that that's not my place. Um, uh, so... Uh, now, if, if the director wants to tell me, because he or she has a specific question about it, I'm always open to talk about it, but it, it's not something I, 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 I really want to know. Because part of it, too, is you sort of want to get to the set and be surprised by some of it. You know what I mean? 
because then it, it sort of stirs you up creatively if you're seeing something going, oh, I never thought about it that way. Or I have this, I have this theory about actors where um, a bad actor takes a line I've written and makes it sound worse. A good actor takes a line I've written and does it exactly the way I heard it in my head. And a great actor does a line and makes me think, I am the most brilliant writer in the world. So there is a certain amount of, of joy to the surprise of, of what happens on the set. Je, je comprends. Et ça veut dire aussi, alors, au montage, comment, comment euh, ça se passe Est-ce que euh, vous attendez d'avoir un, un premier montage euh, du, du, supervisé par le réalisateur Ou est-ce que vous intervenez euh, tout de suite euh, dès, le premier, euh, dès le premier montage pour donner vos directives Well, I stay away from the editing room. Um, uh, the, the editor does an assembly, and then um, the director has, um, I don't know, Christoph, how much time do you have? So five days per episode. Um, but when you do like three in a row, you basically have 15 days, and you sort of play around with the schedule, right? Yeah. So. I stay out of the editing room unless I'm invited in by the director and because I actually use that time to forget about the episode. So I, not, I don't sit there with the script. Yeah. As far as I'm script, script's dead. And I want to not remember anything so that when I see it, I want to be as close to seeing it for the first time as I possibly can be, which is impossible. But mm -hmm. um, because then I think I can be more helpful than standing over the director's shoulder and second guessing and, you know, because, um, again, you have to let them have a certain amount of freedom in order for their best work to come out. Mm -hmm. And then, after five days or 15 days, whatever it is, then I get it, and then I do all the edits from that. Now, I, I send the director the edit that I'm doing so that they can give me feedback and as well as to the network and the studios. Um, uh, but again, ultimately, the decision is mine, how, what the final, final edit looks like. Mm -hmm. And then I do the mixes. I go to the, I go to the, the sounds, you know, the uh, mixing stage, put the music in, put the sound effects in. So I'm pretty much there from beginning yeah. to the end. <laughs> Et, et ça vous arrive, ça vous arrive en, en, en voyant euh, un montage de vous rendre compte que euh, l'écriture, la structure que vous aviez donnée à l'épisode n'était pas forcément la meilleure et que peut-être vous avez envie euh, de, de changer euh, l'organisation la, 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 euh, des séquences. Euh, ça vous arrive à, en ayant pris la distance avec l'écriture et en voyant euh, l'épisode monté de vous dire ah ben là c'est moi qui ai eu tort on devrait changer euh, mettre ça avant telle séquence avant telle autre après ça vous arrive souvent ça that happens uh, too many times <laughs> I'm I'm like I, I I always say to the directors restructure it any way you want leave it any length you want don't try to get it to time just tell the story and um, and then when I look at it I'm always moving stuff around um, Uh, I don't. I can't think of an episode where I didn't do that. Um, uh, but um, it's it, it, what happens is is that it, people forget when you're doing edits that you're experimenting, and so sometimes people panic and go like, "Oh, how could you do that?" You know. Um, but you go, "Well, I was trying it this time, and maybe it didn't work. Maybe something else will work." But it's clearly not working what we had, so you have to figure out something. The other thing that happens is, is that I will write like a, you know, a very long speech, and um, and it will be, you know, somebody saying to somebody, "I love you," but it takes, you know, a page to tell them that. And then I look at the film, and I look at the actor, look at the actress, and and in a look. He says, I love you. So then I go, well, why don't we need all these words? If it plays, if it just plays in a look, then it should play in a look. And uh, so that's the other thing. I'm fairly brutal cutting my own dialogue. <laughs> Et alors, j'ai constaté en regardant la série qu'il y avait beaucoup, à mon, à mon sens, hein, en tout cas, j'ai eu le sentiment qu'il y avait beaucoup plus d'extérieur 
dans la deuxième saison que dans la première. Est-ce que euh, c'est parce que vous avez, vous avez changé de, de lieu de tournage Vous êtes allé plus en Italie ou, euh, ou c'était euh, simplement comme ça le, une volonté d'auteur Ou c'était quoi C'est le, le, tout d'un coup plus d'extérieur, plus de euh, plus de paysages, plus de scènes dehors que, que dans la première saison um. We, um, uh, the, the first season we shot with a budget that pretty much restricted us to being in Czech Republic the whole time. And in the Czech Republic, there are a number of Italian Renaissance palaces because the, the, um, the Czech uh, royalty went down to Florence and they saw all these great buildings and so they hired all these Italians to go to Prague and build these, these palaces. And so, but the problem is we ran out of them in Czech Republic. So the second season, um, everybody agreed that we should go to Italy and shoot. And um, uh, so we shot a, a lot of the uh, series in Italy, but still in Czech Republic. And in the third season, we shot in Czech Republic, Italy, Slovenia, and Croatia, because we ran out of places in Italy. <laughs> so. Um, Because uh, what you know, what's happening is Cesare is conquering Italy. So every week we're in a different we're in a, in a different uh, city in Italy. You can't use the same oh. castle twice. Um, but it was enormous fun. I mean, what was great about it was I got to go to places in these countries that I would have never gone by myself. Uh, and you know, yeah. living in these incredible. I mean, it was very magical. The whole thing, you know. <laughs> Alors, pour en venir juste à l'écriture, il y, y a quelque chose que j'ai appris, c'est qu'on vous avait confié ou qu'on vous avait demandé de prendre dans votre équipe euh, un ou deux, ou, enfin des scénaristes, des jeunes scénaristes euh, européens pour travailler sur Borgia, pour qu'ils apprennent euh, auprès de vous euh, comment euh, à travailler à l'américaine. <rire> Donc, euh, comment ça s'est passé Est-ce que euh, c'était positif pour vous Est-ce que, je pense, pour eux voilà, com Comment ça s'est passé, cette expérience well, Cette formation um, I, You know, when I first really started spending time uh, in Europe, uh, I, I was meeting with various writers groups uh, uh, doing workshops in Prague and in Berlin and in Barcelona and in uh, Dublin and in, in Rome. And um, what became very clear to me was that this showrunner thing really was a phenomenon. And so I thought, well, it's, it's wonderful to be, oh, we, we need Tom Fontana, but it would be more wonderful if there, and I'm not going to live forever, that there be a whole other generation of showrunners who are European. So um, Lagadere and Canel Plus uh, organized, um, uh, I forget how many scripts, it was like 10 scripts that I was sent from 10 different French writers. Uh, I didn't know anything about them. I didn't know how old they were. I, you know, I guess I knew the gender from the title page, but um, Uh, so I just read the scripts, and um, and uh, Audrey's just really stood out. So I, we arranged for me to meet with her, and um, and I said, okay, well, you know, what do you want? And, and she was like, well, you know, I want you to tell me whatever I need to know. And I was like, okay, well, I'll tell you whatever I need to know, and and uh, or whatever you need to know, and. Um, And she was remarkable. She really just was fit in so well with the with the writers uh, in New York. And she came to the set. And um, and then the second season, we did it again with Marie. And equally, it was uh, it was just wonderful because she was a total member of the team. And um, and I think they're both well on their way to being mm -hmm. the first showrunners, <laughs> French showrunners. Uh, I hope so. I hope so. I mean, in the in the yeah. Uh, because they both could do it, and, and it's time, I think, I think it's time for the networks to understand that that is the better way, that uh, you can trust a writer. But you know, I'm a writer who will produce <coughs> I know. my own series. <laughs> so I, I'm, the, I'm one of the first. I'm not the first, but I'm one of, <laughs> in France, anyway. Um, so but but let me ask you a question, if yeah. I may. Um, so when did you start doing 
uh, the, the show? When did you start producing the show? Uh, wait a minute. <laughs> 2005. Yeah. yeah. And you had done it before. Yeah. Now, uh, but you're not a uh, you're not the showrunner. Yes, I am the showrunner. Oh, you are the showrunner, yeah. and you've been the whole time. Yeah. Well, that's why. Why didn't I ever talk to you before? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you are. Alors, j'ai lu que vous aviez envie, enfin que vous pensiez avoir besoin de cinq saisons pour raconter l'histoire des Borgia. Or, euh, il semblerait que finalement, on s'arrête à trois. Comment vous avez finalement donc dealé avec cette, euh, ce terme qui vous était donné Well, it, it wasn't actually given to me. What happened was is that I was really dealing with the, again, the journey of the characters. And what, what I realized was I had enough history to do five seasons, but I don't know if I had enough uh, character journey. And I worried that it would start to look repetitious, that Cesare would just capture another mm -hmm. town and Lucrezia would forgive somebody else and it would just go on and on and on in the same sort of pattern. So it started to make sense that we do uh, the, this you know, third season, uh, but we did do the two extra episodes because what I also realized, I couldn't do the whole story in 12. So Canal Plus, really stepped up and gave us the two extra episodes. But again, it was more character driven than, any, than anything else. Because when you're dealing with historical characters, they die, yeah. and you have to sort of acknowledge that, you know? Yeah. Uh, il nous reste 10 minutes, peut-être uh, y a-t-il des gens qui ont envie de poser des questions uh, dans la salle Oui, là-bas Bonjour et merci pour votre témoignage. Je voulais savoir, vous avez parlé qu'en atelier d'écriture, vous étiez avec plusieurs scénaristes qui venaient de différents horizons. Est-ce que vous pouvez nous expliquer quel était le rôle de chacun Est-ce que l'un s'occupait d'un personnage, un autre un autre Comment vous travaillez ensemble Merci. Um, each, each writer is given a specific episode to write and they write all the characters in that episode. <coughs> And, and so uh, it's very important that they work with the writers, especially the ones uh, in the episode prior and the episode that's coming next where they know what each other are doing. Um, but they, they're pretty much free to go off and, and sort of play to figure things out. Um, and there was no difference. I didn't, I didn't treat uh, Audrey and Marie differently than I treated the American writers. They, They were given as much freedom, and and um, so that, that's why it all just, you know, it was all sort of very happy uh, collaboration. I, I don't know if that answered your question, but <laughs> yes? Oui? Bonjour. Je voulais savoir la structure narrative de l'ensemble de la série et de chacune des, euh, des saisons. Vous la décidez seul ou vous la décidez en accord avec les, vos auteurs Et enfin, une autre question, j'en ai deux, excusez-moi. <rire> comment vous faites pour garder la cohésion des personnages, sachant qu'ils passent de main en main et que forcément chacun a enfin, une façon un petit peu légèrement différente de le voir um, Well, uh, to answer your second question first, um I, uh, that's my job as the showrunner, is to take all the different episodes and, and you know, like, like an orchestra conductor, make the, make the music all sound like one piece of music. Um, that, that's really my job. Trying to keep as much of the individual writer's uh, work, but, but leveling it off so that there's, there's a consistency going from episode one to episode 14. Um, and your first question was, <laughs> I've forgotten. La, la structure. La structure narrative, dans la structure de l'ensemble de la saison et, euh, et les différents épisodes, comment vous faites pour garder la cohésion Right. Um, no, I actually do it alone, and then as I give the individual episode out, um, then, I, then the, the individual writer and I talk about it. So if they have any thoughts, then, then we adjust it. Um, but it, the, 
the initial thing is all from from my brain. Uh, <laughs> For good or for ill. <laughs> Sorry, I'll stand up. Um, it's, a, it's a question in English. So. Ah. <laughs> um, I'm, I didn't see Borgia. My, my particular question is, I, I, you do a lot of research. Wait, wait, wait. You didn't see Borgia? Yeah. I'm sorry. I don't have a challenge. But it's, uh, no. <laughs> no, it's uh, more about Oz. But I suppose the, two, the question is related. Because what, what impressed me with Oz is you have all these characters together who are incredibly manipulative mm -hmm. and they seem to go to very dark places in themselves and there's an intrigue that carries over many episodes something 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 does something that is a resolution three four episodes further where it has impact all around and that's incredibly complicated to structure uh, but my question was to do with the research is where do you go you seem a very nice person but where do you get that from <laughs> to be able to create such a manipulation you know i i I like to think of writing as um, exercising my demons, so that's why I can be a nice person in day-to-day -day life, because when you write Oz or Borgia, you pretty much get all the demons out. Um, but I think that each of, in the same way that you would go to an actor um, and, and ask them to go to a dark place to find how to play the moment, I have to go to dark places to find the moment so it has some truth to it, some some honesty to it, you know. And and there are times when, I mean, both Oz and Borgia, and Borgia's, you know, literally just ended, but I stopped writing it uh, probably in January. Um, they literally haunt me. Oz would not shut up. Uh, I mean, we stopped doing the series, and it would not shut up. And I, I, it was, it, it didn't terrify me, but I just kept going. No, this is not. I'm not writing this anymore. Stop. And and uh, Borges has been the same way. It's just still in my head. The characters are still talking, and it's only by moving on to the next thing that you sort of purify it. And the next thing, one of the things I'm doing is the Twelve Apostles. Talk about going the whole other extreme. Uh, no, no darkness there. So, <laughs> um, but that's that's how you do it. You have to you have to be willing to go. You know, you have to be willing to face the darkness in yourself, and and what you're capable of doing, and what other people you know are capable of doing, and what you look around the world and see what people are capable of doing. But that's also, I think, why I hope my characters are well-rounded, because I don't see anybody, except maybe Hitler, as, as, as evil. I don't, I've never met a, a person who was totally evil any, any more than I met a person who was totally good. So I can find in Cesare Borgia both the bad man and the good man, and that's and with Oz, I did the same thing. The, these prisoners would do these terrible things, and then, and then there'd be this moment where you'd be sympathetic toward them. You know, you'd go, "Well, no, I understand," and then, and then it would twist back around. My my favorite story about Oz was my mother was still alive when the show came on, and she always watched everything I did, and she always she always loved everything I did. And so Oz is coming on, and I go, "Ma, don't don't watch," and she's like. <laughs> She's like, well, no, 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 I really want to see it. And I'm going, I'm going, Ma, please, just don't watch it. <laughs> and we get into an argument on the phone, you know, back and forth, back and forth. And, of course, she's the mother, so she wins. And I go, fine, fine, watch it. But we have to make, there's two things I ask. One is that we never talk about it. And number two, that if a friend of yours says, is that your son Tom's show, you deny it. <laughs> I said, other than that, you can watch. So the show premieres first week. We, we would talk every Sunday. And uh, she doesn't bring it up. And I'm like, yeah, good. Second week, she doesn't bring it up. I'm like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Third week, she goes, we just about to hang up. She goes, Tom, I need to ask you a question about Oz. And I go, Ma, we said we weren't going to talk about it. Come on. And she goes, oh, it's just one question, just one question. And I go, OK, what? She goes, are any more of those nice boys going to die? 
And I was like, yeah, Ma, they're going to die. <laughs> but she would, you know, she just wanted everyone to be good boys. And like <laughs> anyway. Can I ask one thing? Was it a different challenge to work with good character like Lucretia than with the bad characters? Did you, was it anything? Uh, you, you mean in terms of writing them? No, what I'm saying is I never saw any character as bad or any character as good. Lucrezia behaves badly at times, but the difference is, is that, see, each, is, each of the three main characters, forgetting about all the other characters, Rodrigo, Cesare, and, and Lucrezia, are all searching for something. They're searching for a place where they can feel alive and feel good about themselves and feel, you know, like they, they matter and that, they, that they're here for a reason. So if a character has that as the motivation, if they do the wrong thing, it, they're, still, they're still going toward hopefully a positive thing. And so that's why I can forgive them their bad thing <laughs> as well as celebrate their good, with the good they do. Because in the reality is Cesare Borgia did an enormous amount of good in the places that he, he the, most of, the, most of the, the duchies that he liberated, they were, the, the, the dukes were terrible, terrible, greedy, disgusting men. I mean, they were just terrible. And he, again, like Lucrezia, built libraries, built universities, paved roads, made their lives better. But that all gets forgotten. But if you learn that about him, you go, well, the guy wasn't all bad. You know what I mean? He had some kind of renaissance brain, you know, where he was like, oh, no, we can make life better for people. So, um, so it wasn't easier or harder for any of them. I, I loved writing all of them. Can I ask you about uh, with your co-writers? Because every co-writer, of course, is an individual also as a writer. <coughs> but did you see, as you are writing a, a new series, taking place in Europe as an American, and you get in European co-writers. Was there something, some differences in the way you worked with the American? You said that your attitude and, and your working method was the same, but did they give you something, or did you see some differences in the way they wrote from a European angle or an American? I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't think so. I mean, I've never written as an American. I've never, I've never sat down and go, I'm going to write this because I'm American. I, and I don't know, I doubt a European sits down and says, I'm going to write a European. I think what we write is people, and people are universally people. So I don't think that what they brought to it was a, so much like a, a clarity of European thought, if such a thing exists. I don't know. I read the paper. It doesn't seem like there is. But... Um, I think what they brought was their own individual uniqueness to the to the scripts they wrote and to the other scripts they worked on because they you know I would give them a scene to to work on for some, from somebody else's episode so I think that's was more valuable to me you know was that Yeah Yeah, well, they both wrote in English, so I don't, I don't, and they seem to, I mean, they had all the scripts to look at that have happened, so I think they, they maybe adapted, you'd have to ask them, they're both here, you can ask them. Um, uh, I think they adapted to the way we were doing the show as opposed to trying to bring some, some other sensibility to it, I think, I don't know. You said uh, in your writer's team. Uh, can, you, can you just add a, sorry? In, in your writer's team, you give um, uh, you, you give the, uh, different writers assignments, and then you would give them different scenes from other people. Well, what, is what, there any interaction between the writers at all? Yes, yes. What everybody's on the same floor, and there's a lot of running up and down the the hallway with pages in your hand going, "Can you read this? Can you read this?" What happens is with the freelance writers who aren't on staff. When they're done contractually, um, uh, then then I, and I need a fast rewrite. Then I'll give it to one of the staff writers and say, "Will you rewrite this scene?" But there's a lot of conversation um, uh, between all the writers who are on staff. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Then there's a 
Merci Tom de ce merci, moment. Merci.